Hey everyone, tonight we're back into the book of Revelation. Last week we looked at the three three churches, the, the last three churches by one. We looked at Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia. Remember, Thy, Thy, Thyatira means continual or perpetual sacrifice, and that we said was a good description of the church of the dark ages as seen in the Roman Catholic doctrine of the continual sacrifice and the mass. And we met a lady there called Jezebel. We didn't meet her, but she's in there, Jezebel. And Jezebel in Thyatira is the, is the Roman Catholic Church within Christendom in the Dark Ages. And the woman is to be cast, this woman is going to be cast into the Great Tribulation. And this means that unlike the, the true church, the Roman Catholic Church will go into the Great Tribulation and she'll play a role in that time. Next church was Sardis means those escaping uh, and in the historic prophetic um, interpretation it represents the church of the reformation or they're escaping from the roman catholic system and we have philadelphia brotherly love uh, and, in, and in the historic prophetic uh, interpretation it's a fitting church of the 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 great missionary movement from uh, 1700 to 1900 and tonight we're going to look in the book of La uh, the church of Laodicea. Laodicea. What's so special about this church? Well, we're uh, we're in amongst it tonight. Chapter three of Revelation, verses fourteen to twenty-two. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write: These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would you were cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have gotten riches and have need of nothing. And know not that you are the wretched one and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel you to buy of me gold refined by fire that you may become rich and white garments that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness be not made manifest and i salve to anoint your eyes that you may see as many as i love i reprove and chasten be zealous therefore and repent behold i stand at the door and knock if any man hear my voice and open the door i will come into him and will sup with him and he with me he that overcomes, I will give him to him to sit down with me in my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, so to the angel of the church in Laodicea, right. Destination here is in verse 14 is Laodicea. And Laodicea means people ruling. So this is in stark contrast to god ruling in the church in the church we now have people ruling so it's a church entirely ruled by men for the holy spirit is not present and doing his ministry of guiding in this particular church and in the historic prophetic interpretation this becomes an accurate description of the church of the apostasy and this church began in the early 1900s and it continues to the present day. We see the description of the Messiah in verse 14. These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. It's taken here from Revelation 1, verse 4, 6, and 7. So the Messiah is described here as the faithful and true witness, whereas this church is neither faithful nor true to the word. All six of the previous churches had at least one word of commendation, but this church has absolutely none, none whatsoever. There is nothing at all commendable in this church as it is an entirely unsaved church. So this church, the seventh, which is a Laodicean church, is totally unsaved. No promise is given to the Laodicean church that it will escape the tribulation. For being an unsaved church, they will certainly go into the, into the great tribulation. 
So while the Philadelphia church, uh, of which you and I were, were believers, were part of that church, the Philadelphia church will escape the tribulation by means of the rapture. The Jezebel element of the Thyatira church, which is what we spoke about before, uh, the Roman Catholic church, will go into the tribulation and that represents Roman Catholicism. Laodicean church, which represents apost ap ap apostate. I have trouble with words sometimes. Apostate. Protestant Protestantism will also go into the tribulation. And between those two churches, those two religious organizations, they're going to play a, a major role during the Great Tribulation. We'll, we'll see that when we get to chapter 17. We've got, a, we've, got a, we've got 14 chapters to go before we get to that. Okay. Now, in verses 15 to 17, we have the condemnation. He, uh, uh, he says, Jesus says, I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou work cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I'm going to spew out of my mouth. So these guys, the Laodicean church, are characterized by lukewarmness. We have the distinction between hot or, and cold and lukewarm. So the con what's the context here? The hot are the truly saved believers. The cold are those who are not believers and they don't actually claim to be believers. But the lukewarm are those who do claim to believe in Jesus, but are not truly regenerate believers. In verse 17, because thou sayest, I am rich and have gotten riches and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art the wretched one and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So what we see here is that they are characterized by a richness in worldly goods, but are self-deceived. Why? They are spiritually poor, blind, and naked. It's a very good description of the apostate church. For all these traits, they are now being condemned. Revelation 3 the exhortation we see in verses 18 to 20. I counsel thee, buy of me gold refined by fire, that thou mayest become rich, and white garments, that thou mayest clothe thyself, and that the shame of thy nakedness be not made manifest. And I salve to anoint thine eyes, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I reprove and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. So basically for this church, this entire church, the exhortation here is to salvation. First of all, they're to seek spiritual wealth. This church is characterized by physical wealth but they are to seek spiritual wealth from Christ. Secondly, because they are spiritually naked, they are urged to receive the white garments of salvation from the Messiah. Throughout the book of Revelation, the white garments represent and symbolize salvation. Back in chapter three, verse four, these garments are in people considered worthy. In verse 5, chapter 3, they're coupled with not being blotted out of the book of life. In when we get a scene in Revelation 6, 11, they're seen as the garments of the saints in heaven. In Revelation 7, verse 9, and verse 13 to 14, the garments are white because they have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. So what we know is that these garments, these white garments, represent salvation, those who are saved. And the key problem in the Laodicean church is that they are spiritually naked and they're lacking in salvation. And here they're being urged to appropriate salvation in the Messiah. Third thing, because they're spiritually blind, they're urged to seek the Messiah's eye salve. Why? So that they can begin to see spiritually. There is absolutely no indication that this Laodicean church is a saved church. While all the other churches 
have had at least a small saved element in it, this church has nothing at all in it, not a person. They are spiritually poor, they are naked, and they're blind. Absolutely nothing gained for this church. So there's a complete lack of, or a complete absence of commendation for this church in Laodicea. Where do we see Jesus? Uh, where do we see Jesus? Verse 20 emphasizes that the Messiah, where is he? He's outside the church. He's outside. He's knocking in the door outside. Locked out. The Messiah, Jesus, is not in any way within this church. Why? Because this is a totally unsaved church. And the exhortation here is to the, any individual in the apostate church to hear the Messiah's voice and open his heart to him, and then Messiah will enter, and they'll have fellowship. So here, it is another exhortation to salvation. Get saved, church. In verses 21 and 22, we have the promise. He says, he that overcometh, he that overcometh, I will give to him to sit down with me in my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the promise here is that they will receive a millennial portion. They'll have a place in the kingdom. If they receive the invitation to accept Christ, to open the door, accept Christ, and come out of that apostate church. So we're going to see that the apostate church will continue right on into the tribulation. Why? Because it is a totally unsaved church, and it will, it will have for company the Jezebel of the previous church, which is the Roman Catholic Church. So what we're going to see is that there'll eventually be a unity of Roman, the Roman Catholic Church and the apostate Protestantism. And this union is going to develop into a super-religion which we're going to see in Revelation chapter 17. It's going to be one massive church. Now, what's apostasy? Apostasy can be defined as the departure from the truth that one professed to have, right? It doesn't mean that they actually possess the truth uh, because seldom do apostates actually possess the truth. What it is, it is a, it's a departure from a truth that they profess to have because of an affiliation with a particular church. For example, um, a, a minister of a Baptist church or a Presbyterian or a Methodist or an Anglican church, he's professing by virtue of his very position to believe the doctrines of the Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist or Anglican churches. So by, by being in that position, a, a, a minister, or, or a person within that position, a minister especially, he is professing that he believes and he adheres to the doctrines and the, and the, and the, and the creed of that particular church. But actually, the apostate denies these doctrines and he has departed from the truth that he professes to have. And this has been the characteristic of the visible church of the 20th to 21st centuries. And the fact that in the last days of church history, the church was to go apostate was something that was cl very clearly predicted in two New Testament passages. And we're going to look at them right now. Second Thessalonians 2, verses 1 to 3. Paul's writing to the Thessalonian church. I have trouble with that. Thessalonian. Verse 1, chapter 2 of Second Thess. Now we beseech you, brethren, touching the coming of your Lord Jesus Christ, and you are gathering together unto him, to the end that you be not quickly shaken from your mind, nor yet be troubled, either by spirit, or by word, or by epistle, as from us, as that the day of the Lord is just at hand. Let no man beguile you in any wise, for it will not be, except the falling away come first, the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica, uh, and they were troubled by some false teaching there. Some, some guys have come into the church, 
And they were telling him that, listen, we're already in the tribulation. We're already in the day of the Lord. Uh, the, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, this is the most common biblical name for the great tribulation. Whenever you see that expression, either in the Old Testament or the New Testament, the day of the Lord is always a reference to the great tribulation. And here, the, the Thessalonians were fearful that they were already in the tribulation. And, and Paul has to say to them, he says, listen, the tribulation hasn't come yet. Because there's two things which must precede the coming of the tribulation. And the first one is the falling away. Uh, the falling away is the Greek word for apostasy. So the apostasy must precede, must come before the great tribulation. It must come before it. And second, there must also be a revelation of the, of the man of sin. So there must be some identification of the antichrist before the tribulation can begin and since the apostasy the falling away has not yet occurred therefore the tribulation has not yet taken place and this is paul writing to the thessalonians and the point is that preceding the tribulation there was supposed to be a falling away or an apostasy first timothy paul writing to timothy his young disciple, 1 Timothy 4.1. But the Spirit saith expressly that in latter times some shall fall away or apostatize from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Again, Paul writes that in the last days an apostasy, an apostasy was supposed to occur. And in Thessalonians, he specified that this apostasy would occur preceding the beginning of the Great Tribulation. So this Laodicean church is a description of the apostasy of the last days. And, the, and, and Paul now goes on to give certain um, characteristics of the apostasy in these verses. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, 1 Timothy 4, 2 says this, through the hypocrisy of men that speak lies, branded in their own conscience as with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by them that believe and know the truth. Okay. The characteristics of apostasy are seen in four basic characteristics in this passage. This is 1 Timothy 4. One to three. First, oh, sorry. First of all, demons are the source of apostasy. We see that in verse one, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. This is the counterfeit system of theology that is pushed by apostates. The source of that counterfeit system of theology or doctrine is demonic. It's not, it's, it is demonic. It's not man, it is demonic. Second thing, in verse 2, apostasy is characterized by lies through hypocrisy. And what that means we're going to see in another passage. We'll get back to that. Third thing, it is characterized by insens an insensitive conscience. They are branded by, like with a hot iron. They are seared in their own conscience. Fourth thing, there is an attack on Christian liberty, such as forbidding to marry and commanding abstention from meats. And such legalistic apostasy is going to increase as church history unfolds throughout the last days, and these elements become more and more prevalent in the visible church. Okay. Now, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. In the first four verses of 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 4, what we have here is a description of the gener general character of the world during the last days. And all you have to do is to look around, and you can see that these elements are true in this very present day. But know this, that in the last days, grievous times shall come. 
And Paul now goes on and he gives certain characteristics. In verse 5, he says, holding a form of godliness, but having denied the power thereof. From these also turn away. Have nothing to do with them. So here in this passage in 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 4, 1 to 5, apostasy is characterized by having a form of godliness, but denying the power. And this is probably what Paul meant when in, in the first letter to Timothy, when he says it's characterized by lies through hypocrisy, because leaders in the apostate church do have a form of godliness. They appear to be godly. In the apostate churches, often the, the, the basis of the church faith has never been removed. As we said before, for, in, for instance, uh, the, 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 the Episcopal or, or, or like the Anglican church, the 39 articles have never been rescinded. In many of your liberal Presbyterian churches, for instance, they still hold to the Westminster Catech Confession of Faith. Uh, and these are all sound creeds as far as the basics and fundamentals of the faith are concerned. The creeds are good. So outwardly, outwardly, they're claiming to have a form of godliness, but because of the apostasy, they have denied the very power of that godliness. And yet, as far as the outside world is concerned, they're still leaders of religious affairs in the Christian church. They still appear to be godly, but they've denied the power of it. Often, uh, the ones who are most apostates are the ones who are most faithful in wearing all the, all the get up, you know, all the, all the fancy garbs and stuff like that, you know. And, they, and yet, uh, these guys have denied the very power those things were intended to portray to the outside world. So these are the characteristics of apostasy. One of the key characteristics is that the source of apostasy is demons and is characterized by hypocrisy. In 2 Peter 2, the entire chapter deals with the characteristics of apostasy. 2 Peter 2. As you read through the length, that lengthy passage, you don't see Peter displaying any attitude of love or tolerance towards apostates. And in fact, the Bible is not tolerant towards apostasy and it chastises, reprimands it very severely as these verses are going to show you. Another characteristic of apostasy is in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Peter says, But there arose false prophets also among the people, as among you also there shall be false teachers who shall privily bring in destructive heresies, heresies or, de or denials, denying even the master that bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. So another key characteristic of apostasy is that of destructive denials. And the reason these denials are especially destructive, why? Is because they involve the denial of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that, what, and that is what makes them destructive. They deny the person and the work of Jesus Christ. The question now is, how do we identify an apostate church or a person? We're given three basic clues as to the mark of an apostate. Number one, first clue. We find it in, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22. 1 John, the first epistle of John, chapter 2, verse 22 and verse 23. John writes this. Who is the liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, even he that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. He that confesseth the Son hath the Father also. So, what's he saying? Basically, it's this. One of the key points of the, of the destructive denial is the denial of the Trinity. So, one mark of an apostate is that he denies the Trinity. He denies the equality of father and son. That's one destructive denial. This is what John is saying here. A second destructive denial, again, uh, John writes, we see in 1 John, 
chapter 4, verses 2 to 3. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses, confesses not Jesus is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it cometh. And now it is in the world already. Third John, verse 7. The third epistle of John, verse 7. For many deceivers are gone forth into the world, even they that confess not that Jesus Christ cometh in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. So, those verses put them together. The second destructive denial of apostasy is the denial of the incarnation that Jesus Christ has actually come in the flesh. They deny that he's the, the Trinity. They deny that he's come in the flesh. The second person of the Trinity has become a man incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So this means that they deny that Jesus is God, a denial of the God man. This is the second destructive denial. The third one is given in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 to 4. Peter writes this, knowing this for 2 Peter 3, 3 to 4. Knowing this first, that in the last days, mockers shall come with mockery, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For from the day that the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So this third destructive denial is the denial of the second coming. The denial of the physical and visible return of Christ. And often what we see in apostate circles is when they talk about the second coming, they would say the second coming is fulfilled in the rise of church hospitals, church schools, because by this way, we continue the memory in the, in the continuation of the teachings of Jesus. But they would deny a visible and physical return of Jesus Christ. And that becomes a third destructive denial. So we have a, a denial of the Trinity, a denial of the incarnation that Jesus is God, and a denial of the return of Christ, the second coming in a visible and physical way. So there, there, there are three denials here. There are three denials. Now, if someone was to deny those three things, what's the basis? What's the foundation for his denials? For one to deny these fundamental, these are fundamental truths of the Christian faith. They have to then deny the authority of scripture. That's what they have to do. So the first thing they have to do to deny is that the Bible is inspired of God. And this is what they do. So the basis of the foundation for these three destructive heresies or denials is the denial of the inspiration of the word of God. For if, the, for if you accept the Bible as the inspired word of God, then no one's going to deny the Trinity. No one's going to deny the incarnation or the second coming. But once one has given up the, on the inspiration of the scripture as part of his theology, once he says, well, no, that's not quite right. From then on, it's a natural outworking that he'll begin to deny things of the Trinity, the incarnation, and the second coming of Christ. It's a doubt. Once you deny the inspiration of the scriptures, once you deny that they're the inerrant, infallible word of God, you then start to head downwards. No place else to go. And here, here we're going to see some of the deeds of the apostates. We see them in, in, in Jude. Jude uh, verses 17 to 19. Um, and, uh, and 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. We already know of one day, which is mockery. What are they going to do? They're going to come and they're going to mock those who believe in the return of the Lord. But that's not all that they do. They don't just mock. In fact, we, we see them already mocking today. They're mocking today. Besides mockery in Jude 17, this is, this is in Jude 17. But ye, beloved, Remember ye the words which have been spoken before 
by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. But they said to you, in the last time there shall be mockers walking after their own ungodly lusts. These are they who make separations or schisms, divisions, sensual, having not the spirit. So Jude, in his, in his, in, uh, in his, in his little epistle there, he reiterates this. First of all, he, re he reiterates that the deeds of apostates is going to be one of mockery. They're going to poke fun at the basic teachings of the word of God. They'll mock the fundamentals of the faith, uh, such as we said before, the verbal inspiration of the scriptures, the virgin birth, substitutionary death of the Messiah, and his physical re resurrection from the dead. They mock these things. I said, rubbish. Second Peter uh, chapter 3, verses 3 to 4, states that they're also going to mock the doctrine of the second coming of the Messiah. So these are the things that these apostates are going to poke fun at. They're going to poke fun at things of the Trinity, incarnation, second coming. But that's not all that they're going to do. That's not all they're going to do. That's all right. They're verbally doing something there. But what else are they going to do? According to Jude, they're going to create divisions within the church or schisms within the church. And we're going to see shortly, when we look at a, a brief survey of history, we're going to see this. That's a, that is essentially what they've been guilty of. Because what happens is they begin by denying some of the fundamentals of the faith, and then they convince some, but not others. And what's going to happen in, in the course of time, we're going to have two factions in a church, going to develop into a split, and boom, we have schisms. So how did it begin? The process begun by mockery, and then the mockery results in a division of the church. And throughout this age of apostasy, there has been division after division, church after church, denomination after denomination have split over the destructive denials of the Trinity, the incarnation and the second coming of the Messiah. And these, these are characteristics, these heretical teachings and deeds of separations have become more prevalent as church history has progressed from about the 1900s to the present day. This is the age of the Church of the Apostasy. And the roots, the roots of this present age uh, began back in Europe, particularly with German rationalism, where the inerrancy of the scriptures was denied uh, with the development of biblical criticism and documentary hypothesis. Okay. At that time, oh, sorry, whoops, let's move this up here. So if the present age of apostasy had a definite beginning, um, and this is, uh, we're not really not for sure, but, but roughly, roughly, if it began, if it had a beginning in the United, United States, because you know, everything comes out of the United States and we just follow on, it might well have been January the 20th, 1891. Why? Because on that day, there's a guy called Charles Augustus Briggs, and he gave his inaugural address at the Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Now, the Union Se Seminary was a, it was a Presbyterian seminary training ministers for Presbyterian pulpits. And, and Briggs said several things attacking the scriptures, one of which was that there are three great fountains of truth, the Bible, the church, and reason. Rationalism. Thus, reason and the church now becomes equal with the scriptures, equal with the authority of the scriptures. And from then on, went downhill. He's what we'd call a, a, liber, a liberal, not politics, but liberal theolo theologian. He was a, a modernist. And some of the tenets, some of the doctrines and teachings of liberal theology are the Bible is not God breathed, it has errors. Man must determine which teachings are correct and which are not. The virgin birth of Christ is a myth. Jesus didn't rise from the grave in bodily form. Jesus was a good moral teacher, but his followers were um, a, a bit um, um, lib took liberties with the truth, the history of his life, and they said he did all these wonderful things. Hell is not real. Man is not lost in sin and therefore will not face judgment apart from 
a relationship with Christ by faith. They say a man can help himself. No sacrifice of death by Christ is necessary. Why? Because a loving God would not send anyone to hell. And since, uh, and since man is not born in sin, he's okay. And that's, that's some of the liberal teachings that you have. Uh, 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 has any of you ever heard that? I think, I think all of you would have heard things like that. So, if you get the first two decades of the 20th century, apostasy took over the schools, trained ministers for the de denominational uh, churches. And then what happened was they, they tried to stem the tide. And in 1910, they had the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church, and they issued the five fundamentals of the faith. Uh, and these include, uh, we should be fundamentalists. <laughs> First, the inspiration of the scriptures. Yeah, I believe that. Second, virgin birth. Yes, I, I believe that. Third, substitutionary atonement. Absolutely. Fourth, resurrection of Jesus. Absolutely. And fifth, the miracles of Jesus. They are what the fundam they, are, they are the fundamentals of the faith that that this um, uh, this uh, uh, general assembly of the Presbyterian Church came up with. So they came up with it. They said, "Hang on, these are the things that every Christian must believe. Every every minister must believe these things." Oh, but 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 but. And another well-known guy, a, a leader of the modernists or apostate movement, a guy called Harry Fosdick, he said two things. First of all. The virgin birth cannot be accepted by the modern mind. It's simply a myth. Secondly, he said the resurrection of Jesus is not to be seen as a physical resurrection, but it's to be seen in the rise of churches, uh, hospitals, church schools, that sort of stuff. That's how the resurrection of Jesus really should be seen. So what we, what, well, I didn't see it, but what history shows us is that a decade of the 1920s was characterized by this great modernist fundamentalist battle between the liberals, the modernists, and the fundamentalists. And in all four of the major denominations, uh, the Episcopals, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, and the Methodists, guess who won? The liberals were in firm control, and it was now impossible to force them out. And so what happens then? Because you can't force them out, the, the fundamentalists have to then separate themselves from them. And this led to the separatist movements of the 1930s as the fundamentalists pulled out of denominations, either by starting new denominations or by forming independent churches. So the divisions or the schisms that the Bible predicted would occur as a result of the apostasy began to occur in the separatist movements of the 1930s. Moving on. And now, in, in the mid-20th century, uh, we saw the beginnings of the ecumenical movement. 1948, World Council of Churches was formed. Main aim, unity of all churches regardless of doctrine. Let's be one big happy family. Second aim, unity of all religions into one super religion. That's what we're going to see in Revelation 17. In 1950, the old Federal Council of Churches was reorganized into the National Council of Churches. And what were they doing? Attempting to, attempting to unify all the churches in the United States along these liberal tenets. Consequently, what happens? Visible church, the visible church is primarily apostate today. In more recent times, we have a whole new phase. The new phase now claims to affirm the fundamentals of the faith, but... The Bible is no longer the authority. The Bible is no longer the final authority in determining divine truth. But now, in this new move, experience is equally valid. In actual practice, the experience now takes priority over the scriptures. If the Bible contradicts the practice, then the practice is justified as being a new move of the Spirit. And therefore, what the text of scripture actually says can be contradicted by a new experience. And this is another form of destructive denials. What's the proper way of determining truth? Go to the word of God. Go to the word of God first and not rely on the experience of other people. 
The Bible must be the final and only authority in all matters of both faith, what we believe, and practice, actions and experiences. Faith, what we believe, and our actions. In recent years, we have we, we, a new experience or a phenomenon will break out in some part of the church and then people simply try and find a verse in the Bible and say, ah, there it is right there. I remember one guy telling me when we had, remember when we had that laughing movement years ago and he was a Bible teacher. He said, well, Isaac name, Isaac's name mean laughter. Justified it by that. So what we see here is that uh, rather than be willing to admit that this new experience, uh, no matter how wonderful or supernatural it felt, was simply not of God, what do they do? They defend the practice, not on the basis of scripture, but on the basis of their own experience. What's their evidence? Well, I felt, I just felt so happy. I was just full of joy. You know, uh, you know what? Tonight I'm going to have, uh, tonight I'm having Thai food for dinner. I love Thai food. And I'm going to get a, a real sense of joy and happiness eating Thai food tonight. The fact is, any kind of emotional release of this nature will make somebody feel happy. People get really happy when their football club wins, football team wins. Even non-believers can have this same experience. Imagine, Satan wouldn't be much of a deceiver if he makes one feel bad, would he? Satan can give people joyful and happy experiences and doing so would be in his best interests if that, rather than the word of God, becomes the final authority for determining spiritual truth. This must be from God because I just feel so happy inside. What a wonderful time. Let's look at what Isaiah has to say. Isaiah 8, verses 16 and 19 to 20. As you can tell, we're not going to get through all their slides tonight. I thought, I can't rush over this. Now, Isaiah 8. One of the themes of the book of Isaiah he contra one of the theme one of the themes is that he contrasts between the remnant, what's the remnant? They're Jews who believe, and the non-remnant, they're Jews who don't believe. In Isaiah 8, verse 16, Isaiah 8, verse 16, he says, Bind you up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. One crucial difference between the two groups, the remnant and the non-remnant, the believers and the non-believers, is the place that the scriptures have in their lives. The law is the law of Moses and the testimony, the word of the prophets. And what separates them is that the remnant believe that which Moses and the prophets declared. That's the foundation of their faith. And it's also their authority. The non-remnant rejects the scriptures as the final authority. And what they do is they seek to make God more real in their experience. What do they do? They go, they go, moves toward idolatry and looking at gods and goddesses that they could see, feel, and touch. So what they wanted to do was create a more visual picture while they worship. But in verse 19, chapter 8, verse 19, Isaiah says, And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto the wizards that chirp and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God? On behalf of the living, should they seek unto dead, unto the dead? So Isaiah issues a warning that they are not to go after counterfeit spirits and teachers that chirp and mutter. Isaiah is warning people not to pursue supernatural things that cause them to make the strange sounds of chirping and muttering. For while these experiences might come from the supernatural, not everything that comes from out of the supernatural is of God. And verse 19 clearly, clearly shows us this. It may very well be that those who go after those, those that chirp and mutter could well come out with great testimonies of experiencing the supernatural and feeling joyful and great. But Isaiah would not accept any of that as valid testimony. The only valid testimony is what he declares in verse 20, to the law and the testimony. In other words, back to the law and the prophets, back to the scriptures as the only final authority. 
And the closing phrase shouldn't be missed in, in Isaiah 8, verse 20. If they speak not according to this word, surely there is no mourning for them. Isaiah makes it very clear. Regardless of the supernatural experiences the others may have, if it does not align with the written word of God that was already present in Isaiah's day, there was simply going to be no morning light for them. They wouldn't make it. They're goners. And later in his book, in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 29, verses 9 to 14, Isaiah 29, verse 9 says this, Tarry ye and wander. Take your pleasure and be blind. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. Isaiah prophesies how people will become spiritually blind and will stagger about in spiritual blindness. They're going to stagger as if they were drunk, but not with alcohol. People have become spiritually blind and are groping in their spiritual darkness, having no spiritual sight to see. Now, why did this happen? 29, Isaiah 29, verse 10. For Jehovah, for God himself, has poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, the prophets, and your heads, the seers, has he covered. So Isaiah points out that this has all happened because of divine judgment and it is not accidental or coincidental. What has happened is that because they refused to follow Isaiah's earlier admonition back in chapter 8, verse 20, where he says, back to the law and the prophets, what happened was because they didn't do that, they've now been confirmed in their spiritual darkness and therefore they've fallen into a spiritual sleep so that they now have no capacity to understand the prophets. What's the result of this? It says, all vision is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, read this, I pray you. And he says, I cannot, for it's sealed. Now, all of the prophecies of Isaiah and the prophets that came before him have become to the non-remnant, those who don't believe, as a book that is now sealed. It's sealed up. When they're, presented to, to, when, when, when they're presented to someone who is learned, you know, even though that someone has the capacity and training to understand these things, because he chose to pursue that which chirp and mutter, supernatural things, experiences, because he chooses experiences over the word of God, even for the guy who is, who is learned, who has a capacity, the prophecies now become like a seal, a book that he can't understand. Can't understand him anymore. Chapter 29, verse 12 of Isaiah. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, read this, I pray you. And he says, I'm not learned. As far as understanding spiritual truth, he has become just like the one who is not trying to learn. And the trained and the learned one is now just as incapable and just as unable to understand the word of God as the one who is untrained and unlearned. They're both blind, both staggering around like drunk men. The sad thing is that these people appear outwardly to be both spiritual and religious. Verse 13 tells us this. 29, 13. The Lord said, For as much as this people draw nigh unto me, and with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment of men which has been taught them. What's he saying? They continue to draw unto God with their mouths and they honor God with their lips, but their hearts are far away from God. Why are they so far away from God? Because whatever fear they have of the Lord is based upon man-made doctrines, man-made commandments and traditions, rather than that which God himself had said and taught in the scriptures. Remember, they are looking for the experiences, not what the testimony, law and the testimony says. So today, what we see today, 
the, val the validity of a, of a movement is now based on the external. It's now based on verbal pronouncements such as praise the Lord or praise Jesus or some, some similar uh, uh, phrase that you, you consistently repeat it. Oh, praise the Lord, praise Jesus. Uh, and what we see here is that what the Bible-based observer must realize is that this is simply, it's simply a formula, much like those who recite a, a mantra in Eastern religions. Simply verbalizing the name of Jesus over and over and over again does not by itself prove anything. You can have that big t-shirt on saying that I love Jesus. It means nothing. In fact, uh, this verse, it, it fits very well, this verse. It says, and with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but they have removed their heart far from me. Their heart is far from God. Why? For the same reason, it says, their fear of me is a commandment of men, which has been taught them. So what it means is this. They've learned to fear God on the basis of man-made and man-induced experiences rather than on the basis of the word of God. They're following these new man-made doctrines and they repeat phrases they've been trying to repeat, believing that this repetition is what makes them spiritual. Uh, in verse 14 of Isaiah 29, Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. And the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Now, more time is now spent on seeking more experiences than on actual study of the word of God. That's what we're seeing here. More time is now spent. Oh, I, I, I want to have the next. What's the next experience? What's the next? Where's the next conference? Where's the next Jesus conference? What's going on? You know, we, we need to have an experience. The result here is a further judgment where both Wisdom and understanding begin to perish. More and more, as people start to seek deeper and deeper experiences, what, what do they do? They spend less and less time actually in the discipline of studying the Word of God. And what will happen is they're going to reach a point where they begin to totally lack understanding of the Word of God. While they can do God talk and Jesus speak, while they can do those things, when they begin to deal with the concrete details of the word of God, yeah, they get lost. The more experiential they become, the less they understand the word of God. Okay. What the scripture emphasizes, what the scripture emphasizes is that the final authority must be the scriptures, the written word of God, and not somebody's experience. Imagine the apostles. Imagine the apostles. Imagine Jesus, for instance. Jesus could have told the, the, fact, the Pharisees about wonderful things in heaven, but he didn't. He goes to Isaiah the prophet. Imagine the apostles. They could have related a lot of their experiences with Jesus in trying to defend their preaching of Jesus. But one thing the book of Acts keeps reemphasizing is that Paul, Silas, and the others always made their final authority the word of God and not their experiences. As great as those experiences were when they were personally with Jesus. One example we see is Acts chapter 17, verses 1 to 4. This is Paul. Now, when they had passed through Am Amphipolis and Apollo Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where it was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his custom was, went in unto them, and for three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the scriptures, opening and alleging that it behooved the Christ to suffer and to rise again from the dead. And that this Jesus, whom said he, I proclaim unto you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and consorted with Paul and Silas. And of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. So by and large, we don't find Paul using his personal experiences, especially that amazing experience on the damascus road he doesn't use his experience as a tool for evangelizing for paul the final authority had to be the scriptures and not his own experience or testimony and therefore that was the focus of his evidence 
And that is what convinced so many people. It was the word of God, the scriptures. And for Paul, it was the, it was the, the law and the prophets. So those who came to believe, we see, they, didn't, they did so. They did not do so because of any signs or wonders that they saw Paul perform. How did they believe? Because, they, because of how he reasoned with them from the scriptures. He expounded the written scriptures and he showed how Jesus fulfilled them. And the two times recorded where Paul does use his Damascus Road experiences when he is, uh, um, after he became a believer, it, it was used as part of his defense when he's on trial. He never used it where his goal was evangelizing. Proper place for testimonies, but personal testimony can never be a final authority. So your experiences cannot be the final authority. Testimonies are subjective because people who have converted to other religion, religions like you know, uh, uh, Jehovah Witnesses or Mormons or Christian Science, they can all give you personal experiences as well. They can all tell you how wonderful it is. That's why, here again, final authority and criteria has to be the written word of God. Testimonies can never be the final evidence of the authenticity of one's claim. I've got three minutes. I've got three minutes. I'm going to use it. Acts 18, 28. Again, it says he powerfully confuted the Jews and that publicly shown by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. This is Apollos. This is speaking of Apollos, right? All that he had to say was also based on that which was written. He refuted the unbelievers. Is refuting the unbelievers was not based upon signs and wonders, but it was based upon the scripture, the word of God. One more example, Acts chapter 28, verses 23 to 24. And when they had appointed him a day, they came to him into his lodging in great number, to whom he expanded the matter, testifying the kingdom of God and persuading them concerning Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken and some disbelieved. Here again, we see Paul, he was not using his experience or signs and wonders. What he used was the scriptures. His whole focus was on the law and the prophets, the written scriptures of that day. And that was to authenticate what he was teaching and preaching. The response was that some believed and some disbelieved. But those who did believe came to believe on the basis of the exposition of the written word of God. 